It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Paul Goff, the Pro Vice Chancellor and Vice President of RMIT University, who's given up his first executive meeting with his new VC to speak today. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. You can know where he'd rather be. I first met Paul last year at a meeting of the, at the ARC where we were both presenting papers that addressed the, que the question of how the quality of artistic research could be understood within the field and within the broader research community. And I really keep stressing that, you know, we can't just talk to ourselves. We have to be speaking to that broader research community. Um, for my sins, I gave a paper called Beyond Solipsism in Artistic Research. While Paul spoke of his extensive experience in the evaluation of research and more generally, and artistic research in the research assessment exercises in the UK, New Zealand, Romania, Hong Kong and Australia. It was perhaps some surprise for me to learn that Paul's time was not only taken up in university administration and research assessment, but, uh, but, Paul, uh, but he also manages a very active and prolific life as an artist and a writer. Paul is a painter, broadcaster and writer who is exhibited globally and is represented in the permanent collection of the Imperial War Museum, London and the Canadian War Museum, Ottawa and the National War Memorial in New Zealand and is internationally known for his research into imagery of war and peace. In addition to this, he uh, has an exhibiting record and has published a monograph on Stanley Spencer, Journey to uh, Bouglaire in 2006, A Terrible Beauty, British Artists in the First World War in 2010, and Your Loving Friend, an edited correspondence between Stanley Spencer and Desmond Hutt in 2011. He's also happens to have produced books on the street artist Banksy in 2012 and, and on oil painters John and Paul Nash in 2014. So, just a, a man who does a few things, and so I'd like you to welcome um, Paul, Paul's presentation today, and you'll, I think you all now have your programs. His uh, introduction today will be called Seeing the Woods from the Trees, Research Ecosystem, it, sorry, Research Ecosystem or Academic Jungle. Please welcome Paul Goff to the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barb. That was splendid. And uh, yes, I should be with the Vice-Chancellor at the moment. Um, this is much, much more fun than being there because we're talking about um, pricing of university uh, degrees at the moment. And what happened at Senate the other day, God knows where Australia is going in the next few years, but it's interesting times. I've been in Melbourne for a year now, loving every minute of it, still can't get used to the different weather at different times of the day, but it is an extraordinary place to be. And, and again, thanks to Barb, who we first met in, in Canberra last year, and I learned a huge amount from, from uh, uh, listening to Barb and getting to know the great and wonderful people in the fine arts sector across this remarkable country. Um, the title, uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, partly because you use the kind of landscape metaphor rather wonderfully in the next couple of days. I think uh, uh, we're talking about the field uh, tomorrow. Well, Phoebe's talking about orchids, and John will talk about field as well, and someone tomorrow is talking about flowers and al almonds. And um, Barbara just mentioned the word thorny, because I think still the field is contested. It is full of, it's a thicket of thorns, and getting to the other side is something I'm gonna talk about for the next short while. So without further ado, let's see what we have. Oh yes, I love this slide about uh, the difference in what an artist sees and what another person sees, uh, the different colors that are used. Because somehow, you know, I wear a senior management academic leadership hat, but when I go into my studio on a Saturday, or even this evening, if I get there after the talk I'm supposed to be given this evening, I'm as, as vulnerable and as good as my last drawing. And I have to, it's a great leveler for all of us here involved in practice that we have to remember we're both engaged in the stuff, the doing, the materiality, but we also have to face out, and Barb put it so beautifully there, we have to remember we're part of an academic ecosystem that is vigorous, rigorous, and often very jealous. And I think we have to work within that, and we are working in an environment in this country, and certainly where I came from in the UK, that still likes to look upon this sector as something as a kind of quirky, uh, something quite difficult and irreverent. And I think we should play to all those strengths, but we have to satisfy the whole idea that we have rigor, objectivity, and we have a kind of scholarly uh, behavior that means our subject is, is um, both permeable, but 
uh, capable of fending off all sorts of attacks. And that's not for me to get defensive, but we'll see where we, where we go. Um, coming of age, great. Uh, I think that's so true. I think the strategic conversation that we are in now is so important. And coming from the UK and having taken part in many, many research assessment exercises over the last 10, 15 years in that country and overseas, I saw some subject associations get their act together much, much faster and then start to determine the rules in a way that uh, fine art only latterly arrived at that space. But where are we at the moment? I think the health of the arts in Australia, a new report that came out last weekend, rather wonderful, rather fantastic in terms of where we are. There it is there. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it yet. It's a big, thick report, as every report in Australia seems to be. Um, full, of, full of, read the exact summary. Read the a couple of pages of stats. It's some very, very impressive stuff. So yes, booming, but ever vulnerable. Ever vulnerable to um, federal disinterest and to other disinterests. The status of the arts and research councils accepted, but still under some pressure, lacking, one might argue, the scholarly infrastructure. Contribution of the arts to research, significant but easily challenged. You know, think of the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, medical and maths agenda is very, very powerful. And I remember being part of a movement in the UK to add arts into STEM, to turn it into STEAM. But it didn't go, it didn't go very far. But the other argument was putting design in with the engineering and, and the like. And I took part in many um, research council strategic advisory groups where we had to start to play a certain sort of game, recognizing that there was money to be had, but it meant sometimes uh, dancing with the devil. So yes, booming, accepted, but vulnerable. And those of us in, the, in this room who are on the kind of foothills of the ecosystem, of the foothills of the kind of mountain range in terms of fine art research, the, the start of PhDs or halfway down the line of PhDs, are part of the kind of boom we're seeing, but also part of the potential avalanches in that, in that mountainous landscape. So there's the book. And yeah, so coming of age, we're in the strategic conversation. Uh, a crucial step in determining the agenda. I'll never forget in the UK watching the Association of Art Historians in about 2006, 2007, meeting in a crowd no larger than this and settling their differences, the art historians, the design historians, the architectural historians, and figuring out where they ought to be when the evil world of research assessment came around, and also the benchmarking exercise that was happening across, my, across the UK in terms of the, the kind of key learning outcomes. And they worked together. They settled their differences and they worked together. Fine art took a lot longer to get to that place, and I think that level of disorganization was fine. It needed to be, uh, you know, some wild conversations needed to happen, but I watched the art historian sort it out. And to a degree, I think that's one of the places you are at the moment in this very important strategic conversation. Leading the sector dialogue, you must be vigilant, rigorous, and challenging, challenging each other. You know, I think there's no point in us being together unless we do argue, critique, don't fall out, there's no point falling out necessarily, but my favorite maxim at the moment, and I shared this with my executive team yesterday morning as we were looking at um, a spatial planning approach for the entire college that I run, a college uh, in RMIT of 25,000 students, and discussing space and studios and terrain is one of the most vexed subjects you can do in any university. Space is the most important thing, then it's website, then it's car parking, and then it's the size of your office. But space is one of the big ones. And I said, again, the famous Oscar Wilde quote, um, if two people are constantly agreeing, one of them isn't thinking. And I think what we have to do here is constantly challenge, critique, and, you know, and, and knock the corners off some of these big discussions we're having and avoid becoming parochial. Fine art is an expanding field. Um, it thrives on that kind of roaming. It thrives on being different. It thrives on mutating into different shapes. And we can see that through the presentations today. To a degree, one has to keep that alive and, and happening. And of course, you can rely on a huge amount of literature. When I did my PhD many, many years ago, there was nothing. I think there was one book called How to Thrive and Survive a PhD, or was it How to Survive a PhD? And the only diagram I remembered in it was a kind of roller coaster diagram showing the points of depression you had during writing a PhD. <laughs> what we have at the moment is a lot of material out there, very impressive material, not least the work that, that Barbara's been doing here, um, uh, Leon and Richard Blythe in RMIT, uh, Carol Gray in Scotland, who I've worked with a lot in the last 10 or so years. And Carol, Carol's book, Visualizing Research, describes the research path in um, a metaphor of journey. 
you can look at it yourself. It's very, very evident. There's um, a website that takes you on that journey from planning it, mapping, locating position, crossing terrain, interpreting the map. And I think it's very useful in terms of these strategic conversations we're having and you are having to be able to visualize. We are visual, we are haptic, spatial. We have that kind of, um, uh, I think we have that special edge as fine artists and arts educators where we can see something, experience something. And I like the idea of, of describing the research program uh, being a spatial, a geographic, a topographic approach. So, um, and this is a quote at the top here from uh, Barbara's book around the key questions that are being asked. And these are not easy questions to answer. Um, and then at the bottom, a colleague back in Bristol where I was working who came out of um, drama and created a, a, a rich dialogue around research through practice, practice as research. And as Barb picked up at the very beginning, we still use a whole cluster of words to describe practice-based research, research-led practice, practice as research, practice as research in performance, uh, there's hundreds of them. Uh, we play around with them like some sort of crazy uh, anagram, but that's fine. I think we kind of know where we are and perhaps we don't need to bother trying to pin it down too much. So the literature exists, the historiography exists, it is rich and it is being enriched by events such as this. Uh, and, and long may it be, because for so long it didn't exist. Uh, for a long time, it was seen as you were kind of on the outside, and that's not fair on us, because it's not fair on the kind of rigour we bring to our own practices. Um, I'll do this in three parts. I've already started talking about measuring research, the tyranny and opportunity of evaluation schemes. So that's, a, that's a really managerialist thing to write there. I read that with great relish at 11 o'clock last night. Um, learning from elsewhere, common mistakes. Got to keep looking out, you know. I was involved in the research assessment exercise in Romania, of all places, as one of 30 EU experts. That was a, I learned lots of lessons there, lots of mistakes, uh, largely to go in the room that didn't have the air conditioning. Um, learning from each other, how can DDCA continue to drive the conversation? So I'll try to allude to those three fairly rapidly. And why are we here? I want to talk a little bit about research evaluation. Even if you're involved in your PhD, your supervisor will be involved in a world of research assessment, of measurement, calibration, of understanding what difference is that research, what difference is that practice as research making. And I guess we are in, a, in a, um, an audit society. Knowledge society uses instruments for competitive edge. And there's a new um, paper out by an ex-vice-chancellor in the UK who now works at the Institute of, London, of Education in London, Peter Brook, which I, I borrowed some of the ideas from here because he's managed pithily to say two things. That in general, the arts, humanities, and social sciences are booming, much like the arts are here in many ways, and yet we know how tough it is. And we also know that out there, there's a lot of people who want to measure what we're doing, and we have to respond in particular ways. And so there's an anxiety at the same time as growth. We combat complexity of, of mass higher education. Higher education could not be a more complex landscape. Uh, the sheer volume of compliance, the, the ambition for inclusion, the idea that we're still caught in this big debate about regulation and deregulation, a market economy that's trying to drive change through higher education, uh, is, is means that we, we use audit, we use calibration as a way of trying to control some of that. Uh, we have also embraced, our sector, me included, we have fallen headlong into this idea that there is a discourse of excellence around world class, uh, which is an interesting one. Um, why have we done that? Partly because we want to be at the top of league tables. We want to be seen as world class, and we're willing to start to kind of debate that. And that's one for those of us who are in, in leadership positions to say, how happy are we, are, are we here? You are the PhD students here, are the academics of the future. Are you going to be happy to take on that mantle of understanding the difference between internationally recognized work and internationally excellent work. So I think there's some interesting kind of, um, not just semantics, there's some fundamental uh, discussion to be had here about standing. And of course, research evaluation is used as a way of allocating money, no doubt about that. Um, I will then ask the question, is that different from the art world? The world that I operate in, uh, I've shown in galleries, uh, I've sold the odd painting here and then. And is it different? Are we in a parallel world? We'd like to see them as different. Professionals over here, the academics over here, us in the middle trying to kind of find out what, what works together. Who narrates the meta-narrative? We've no need now for kind of the Vasari overlay, for somebody else to write our story. We are writing it ourselves. What's the status of gallery, the commission, the prize? And in a sense, we are part of that. We endorse the notion that there are competitions, there's hierarchy, there's world-classness. 
and we have our own minds that a gallery there has a different status to one here. And I think one of the things I've seen more of in this country is a ready acceptance that that, that taxonomy, a hierarchy, actually exists. I would argue, and I've argued in the UK, and we got our, our way there, is that the intrinsic quality of the presentation, the practice, the research, is what you look at, not where it's been exhibited. And that's quite contentious, but it's just a point of view. And then this whole thing of professional practice versus academic. What is the difference? You know, when I look at research, practice-based research, I have to ask, often in the design areas, where's the, where's the, the interface between advanced professional practice and research? What are the indicators? And as PhD students out here, you will know what the indicators are. They're about method, they're about context, they're about field of inquiry, they're about rigor. Getting those right is hard. And I think it's one of the things that's challenging any of us. Uh, and having just gone through, the, as many of you have, the era of preparation where you're trying to write that statement, trying to lend an objectivity to the process of practice, isn't easy. Oh, that's my, my background in terms of the global spread of research assessment. It's like some sort of virus that travels around the world like Spanish influenza and wipes people out. Uh, that's my experience of UK, Europe, um, Romania, uh, New Zealand, and recently, last year, I've spent much of last year, it seemed, in Hong Kong, assessing the research in Hong Kong. Uh, and people performed extraordinarily well. There is such a quality of fine art practice globally within the academy uh, that it's, it's a privilege, an absolute privilege, it's bloody hard work, but it's a privilege to be able to see so much work. Oh, there's me uh, with my team in Hong Kong, and there's a room I spent like months and months of my life in. Uh, rooms without windows are very difficult, aren't they? But they're perfect for research assessment. So, <laughs> so basically thousands of items, boxes of, of catalogues, of, of uh, books, of um, CD-ROMs, you know, sonic arts, you name it, come through the door and they are evaluated by two to three evaluators. And this is a, this is a global uh, tendency now. And there are colleagues in the room here who will be taking part in ERA. And there are others who one day will end up being on panels in this room and will play a part in that and will bring to it all the kind of probity and sincerity and integrity and, and get a sense of that privilege to be close to such a great body of work and then have to kind of sift it. Anyway, what's interesting about research evaluation uh, and PhDs play a part in this because they're part of the ecosystem because every single uh, researcher practitioner in an art college will have uh, PhD students is that they look all the same uh, research evaluations. Okay, in Hong Kong it was slightly different. There was a vast amount of money at stake, uh, around about $5.6 billion. Uh, in the UK, we're now five times into this. There's, again, significant amount of sterling, $1.5 billion at stake uh, in Romania, a very, very light touch. Uh, the best part about being in Romania, which I've shared with people here before, some people here before, is they kind of didn't show us the artifacts, the objects. They took us to the art schools. And visiting the art schools was just great fun. He went into an art school and they said, here's Brancusi's sketchbook when he was a student here. And I thought, well, you know, I'll get the, uh, the research assessment. This is much more interesting. Uh, New Zealand, very different approach. Those of you from AUT are here will know that New Zealand approach is very different. Grades every individual, uh, a very different um, uh, approach to research assessment rather than seeing the, the output on its own. Uh, I enjoyed the New Zealand assessment exercise enormously. I thought it was very, very brilliantly run. Um, and yet they're all the same. They look different, yet they're all the same. They use indicators of excellence, significance, originality, rigor, background, contribution, significance. The language is somewhat similar. Peer or expert review is essential. Um, there are some concerns I've already mentioned. What does world leading mean? Le In Hong Kong, we had many, many tense, not tense, but interesting, deep discussions about the nature of region the nature of nation, the nature of community, the nature of, of state identity, given their proximity to different scales of country. Uh, and you have to bottom out those discussions quite fully before you can even go into a discussion of what uh, regional is, or national is, or world is. And those are, they're not just epistemological, these are fundamental in terms of understanding how to assess an environment. And then at the bottom there, the inexorable pull towards the hardback book, the cover, inexorable. And, and you have to keep, and I do, and I went on the road, <laughs> you know, all over the world it seems, saying, practice matters, that if you can articulate the research content of um, a, a body of work in ceramics, or in silversmith, or in uh, media, or in textile, or whatever, 
and not just medium, but just if you can articulate the, the integrity of that practice as research, then that's important we do. And I've met vice chancellors and rectors and all sorts of, of very august art design media organizations who have said, yeah, but look, if it's inside a hardback cover, you know, it really matters, it feels weighty, you know? So we have to uh, watch that. And I think panel members and those of us, all of us here really, have to make sure that in terms of integrity and probity of approach, we are squeaky clean because there is a tug, just as a tug towards STEM funding, there is a tug towards the respectability of, of book, of text. Uh, so just a, a word there of caution. And again, our, our subject, as you see from the abstracts, uh, wonderful abstracts that have been put together for this next few days, we are diverse, we are impure, what, what a chemist would call, call um, an impure amalgam, you know, hybrid activity that we've created, we've generated. We stray, we stray from um, the world of media across installation into computer science towards microelectronics. You know, I've seen all sorts of extraordinary work with animation, working with neural scientists. So we are permissive as a, as a subject, and that's one of our strengths. It may also be seen as one of our weaknesses. Um, the challenges we face, there are many challenges. In fact, the middle section of this is all about challenges because we have to be fairly honest to ourselves, is <clears throat> a challenge when each of you are working on your doctoral program or each of you are working towards um, your Hertzsey return or each of you are trying to locate the research output. At what point does process become product? Big question here, big question. I don't go into my studio and think, you know, maybe I do. Uh, I know what product I want at the end of it. The process tends to kind of lead. Process takes me in all sorts of places. At what point does research assessment allow process to be evaluated? Big discussion at the moment about policy papers, about grey papers, about professional papers that will not count at the moment, I think, in Hertzsey. So, you know, we need to think about when process becomes product. And again, about methodologies. Big part of your activity as research students, those of you here as research students, is about the, 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 the method we take, the, the training we give you as well in terms of methodologies. Very, very important in terms of the, the initial, the early stages of your PhD. And then action research. The paper I was mentioning by Peter talks about who are the actors in this? Is this really just action research or is it more than that? And what is the quality of our, as I said, research methods training? Uh, and can we stand by that nationally um, through doctoral training centres, through an agreed programme, et cetera, et cetera? Um, the other one, the other challenge, I guess, very much is uh, what's the interpretive framework? This is one of the problems many of us face in terms of writing up and talking about and articulating. I've got a little example in a second of articulating the, the research-ness at the heart of what we're doing. Um, what is the interpretive framework? What are the meta-narratives? They're given way to kind of micro-narratives. We know that. The big organizing um, meta-narratives that kicked off the first part of the 20th century have given away to, to lots of um, micro uh, uh, stories and presiding organizational structures. <clears throat> and is your substructure sustainable? One thing that is going to be a test for any of us in, in straightened times is about research groupings that you're all part of. And certainly in research assessment exercises and on research visits I've made to organizations, I'd always ask, how rooted are the PhD students into the organization? How do they know they're part of the ecosystem that is built around strength rather than just isolated. And the worst experience for a PhD student, I think, is to be isolated, to be caught on the edges. The margins are always interesting, and you can see that we live to a degree in the margins, but they ain't good in terms of structured study support. Relevance has become a big word. It's emerging as one of the most important issues, and I think whatever this government does in this country, it will probably follow the example sooner or later, as I've seen elsewhere. Public money being put into research, public money put into your scholarships, into RTS places, etc. public money being put into um, collaborative research centres, into uh, ARC. Big question will then be asked. After years and years and years of plenty, the question will be asked, so what? What difference? What difference is your research making to the public good? And that's a kind of, that's a challenge. Last few years, UK has been through a big impact assessment exercise. And the arts and social sciences and the humanities came out, as far as I'm led to believe, extremely well. We can make our case for impacting on society, on culture, on the knowledge economy, on the creative industries very, very well. But it's not easy. It's not easy at all. And in fact, I'm just advising and working with a small group, and I should be at that meeting today as well. So I'm not, I'm here. 
um, Australian Academy of Humanities are having to put together a piece of work about uh, how can we talk to Treasury about making sure that international collaboration is a benefit to this country. You think, you know, we're all kind of um, decent-minded people. You think that was axiomatic. Yes, it is of benefit, sharing, you know, uh, intellectual wealth and working with others overseas. Now we have to sit up, create a case saying, let me show you how it benefits this country. So interesting days, always on one's guard. So yes, relevance is going to be a big one, and it's there already. What are we doing? What actually is excellence? Big question that the papers I've been reading raise. We've started to look at the word excellence in all sorts of, through all sorts of lenses. Um, define process within scholarly culture, or is it a process that can only be assessed as product? You know, again, it goes back to that process versus product, which research evaluation, which even putting together the PhD starts to ask. And of course, should it rely on an expert review? Expert review is an interesting one. You know, we believe in peer review. Your PhD thesis will be examined, your exegesis will be examined by those who we hold as peers, as those we hold as equals and knowledgeable experts. But peer review has its critics, of course. It requires a well-defined community that already exists, and of course your subject areas are in areas that may not yet exist. Uh, aligned scholarship, interesting, are we all aligned? Peer review is innately conservative. It works to existing paradigms, and it struggles with interdisciplinarity. We know that. We know how difficult it is. Uh, I know how difficult it is to get supervisors or examiners to kind of look at work that goes and strays across many boundaries. So peer review is, is held as being the kind of the touchstone of quality assurance in research and PhD, uh, HDR study, but certainly uh, it's under pressure under pressure because we're asking all the right questions of it. What's the alternatives? Well, they're not much better. They're not much better. Metrics? Wow. This, this whole sector kind of, whoa. Metrics, input and dollars. And that's one very easy metric to run over any organization. Uh, I think we can kick against that, but we also have to understand what might be gained by working partly with it. Or performance indicators, output and impact. This is the kind of managerial language I live with all the time, um, but I think to a degree you have to understand this is around and amongst us. Key performance indicators, output, impact, and metrics. And as you gain confidence, or already are confident as a, as a subject uh, sector and as a, um, an association, and as you come of age, you have to start grappling with that because it's not an easy one, and I know there are very, very, very bright people in here who are well, on, uh, well across this challenge. <clears throat> um, you all know this back to front, but it's always a good reminder. So last few months, many of us have been involved in helping our colleagues, helping, chastising, shouting at them, encouraging them, supporting them to write creative work statements to make sure that this definition, which we will be uh, assessed against, is understood. And what goes in and what is required has to be understood. Many of you will be able to play this back to me verbatim without, with your eyes closed. Uh, others will grow into this. And again, this isn't just about us in leadership positions, those of you doing PhDs who will move into this world will have to inherit this and shape this in your own way in the next five to ten years because it ain't going to go away. It's part of our kind of, um, uh, it's part of the, the, the water we swim in. And this is one I asked um, recently, I asked some staff in my place, what are the challenges putting together creative work statements? What are the challenges in articulating uh, practice as research? And here's, here's one of my colleagues wrote to me saying, I see this, I see this, a Frederica Smith curator inviting me to show my work, The River, as part of Tantamount. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I hope this is unreal, a fictitious one, not a real one, but it's anyway, just um, an example. This is what was returned as an idea for a creative work statement. It was shown in an exhibition in Berlin, later sold to a major national gallery. It was reviewed by The Age. I don't think I have the press cuttings. <laughs> I love that, I know that, I know that. You all know that, you can see people thinking, oh God, I've had a few, I've had a few of those across my desk, or, or about a few hundred of those across my desk. So, so what, and this is fairly new to me because I've been different, used to different systems, but this again, a synthesis of discussions with colleagues uh, in my university and other universities is how we might have to kind of um, approach this, especially those who are new to it, because it's, it's a learned language, it's an academies you have to learn, and, and certainly those of you doing PhDs have known that you have to learn a certain l way of articulating. Uh, the thoughts and the practice. Um, 
talking in general terms, describing it as if you're describing to a student or to a group of students or to groups of colleagues. One thing I've done in the past is using interview technique. We just talk to people, elaborate. But by and large, you have to make the first go yourself. You have to write, write out long and then expect long sex, sort of sessions of redrafting. And we're very uncomfortable. I, I don't mind someone scribbling all over my own writing because I, I, I write very clumsily and I think it's very hard actually to write artist statements, which is a sense what these are. And certainly the work that Barb has done and illustrates beautifully in the book talks about ways of approaching this task. And I think as a sector, one of the things one can do and as, a, as an association, one of the things you can do is share this knowledge uh, and make sure that although you're in competition with each other, a lot to be gained by sharing. And go back to the art, uh, the artists' um, uh, association of art historians uh, that I told you about in the UK. They deliberately set out to share and to arrive at a pooled uh, position. They knew they were going to be in competition to a degree, but they sensed that there was more to be gained by sharing. There's more to be gained by trying to trade fellow, uh, sort of uh, trade secrets, as it were. Um, so those are kind of ways in to, to articulate. And this. there are other ways, but I'm just kind of curious to ask my people what it was like. And so final section, really, which is about how you articulate the researchness in practice. And I've shown these slides before to you, or to groups of people, in fact, all over the world, because actually there's some very, very kind of uh, fundamental questions you ask about what is the contribution? Hard to get that, isn't it? What is contribution to knowledge? First of all, that's a big, big kind of question, isn't it? distinct from existing research. What's the field that it's in? Those of you who've got PhDs or have done them recently know you've had to find this. You've had to make what's an original contribution, which is an immense ask of anybody. The nature of the original investigation of the inquiry, what were his hypotheses? When you run these questions past colleagues and ask to, to elaborate, it's actually a, a very helpful framework for starting to explore some of the kind of inner workings, the innards of one's practice and one's approach to practice. Key one here goes back to process and output. The work that we see, the work that enters um, the discourse is in the, has to be in the public domain. And this is as true of PhDs as it is of research output. One of the hardest things I think at the moment in any country is finding out who's doing what in PhD. Not what who's published or who's, had, who's finished their PhD, but who's doing their PhD in what subjects. That's why these sessions are so essential. Um, you know, can it be accessed? Can it be seen? Is it available for future scholars? And the bottom one at the bottom there, can future generations of researchers access the new knowledge? How explicit can you make that new knowledge? And I think there is something upon us to make sure that our repositories, that whether we're using supernova or whether we're using culture uh, or whether we're using a whole load of different sort of uh, approaches to uh, creating libraries of knowledge that we enter into that willfully and respectfully because I think we have to, as an academy, share so much of that knowledge. Not easy, but I think that's one of the burdens of us as educators. And, of course, the um, question I've just been talking about, a peer review, how do we trust that? Who scrutinised it? What were the processes that your work went through? We know that the gold standard of PhD is that external examination, is that evaluation, is that thorough investigation by, uh, by examiners. That's seen as being the, the, the threshold. Likewise, in terms of the practice-based research. And I think that we have to be sensitive to some of the tensions in the art world about you know, allegations of favoritism, allegations of bias. And certainly when we were in uh, working overseas on research assessment recently, the tension between what the government funded and what was not funded, the nature of national versus um, local patronage, was something that was sort of under the surface quite a lot, and we had to spend quite a bit of time bottoming that out. But again, peer review is meant to kind of make sure that uh, the level of scrutiny and the objectivity and the rigor is held in place. And then impact and afterlife. One of the things that this sector, that each of you as practitioners has, and I guarantee in that pile of press cuttings, in that pile of reviews, uh, on, on web hits, etc., we all have a rich kind of afterlife for the piece of work that we've produced. And one of the recommendations made by colleagues who've been working on um, uh, creative work statements is, even if the reviews were bad, we can still build, build those in. I think it's very important that that trail, that trace of reception, public reception, is kept. And so those are very important kind of uh, messages to send back about keep good records. Uh, it's not an easy one to uh, get right, but it's important. 
I put this up, it's not fair, because I put one called the best design, and then this one follows the worst fine art. But having looked at thousands of items of, uh, and again, hundreds of PhDs around um, fine art, what are the mistakes that we make? They're obvious in many ways. You all know these. The evidence is appalling. Uh, I once opened a box uh, expecting um, a design artifact, um, a record of the piece of work. It, tr it sounded fantastic in the work statement, the creative work statement. So I opened the box and inside was an invoice showing how much the commissioner had paid for this piece of furniture. And that is one form of evidence, but it wasn't what I was looking for. Um, can't identify the research content. It doesn't shift the agenda. And the pressure, again, on many PhD students, HDR students here, is about what's the agenda? How are you moving it forward? What's your field? How are you addressing that field? Which methods are you using? Making those explicit, I think the generation of HDR students that we have and now come through are so enriching that ecosystem that we have that go back 10 years, I suspect, didn't exist. And now we are in a much richer uh, environment. As Bob said, we now have the terminal degree it's a funny phrase, isn't it? Terminal degree. <laughs> I don't like it at all. Um, but we have such a richness of experience in the country now. Uh, and I guess the final one there, we have to belong to a family of research in the institution. Lone scholars are fine, but no one's a lone scholar. We are networked, and making the most of those networks is very, very powerful. Um, these are phrases from reports I had to write about um, uh, where we saw great work, but where we saw where more care, where a more comprehensive picture could have been applied. Um, a misunderstanding of the textual descriptor or the creative work statement. Most, most of this you'll either understand or actually might willfully ignore because it'll come around in four or five years' time again. And so finally, really, I was going to ask about some... Uh, Barb mentioned uh, Banksy. What I've done so far is covered research as an evaluative tool, I uh, mentioned about peer review, I mentioned about the ecosystem we're involved in, I mentioned also the sheer buoyancy of the sector we are now in, but the danger of being complacent. I've just touched on the richness of the, of, and the depth of learning and the depth of experience that is just in this room, but if you multiply that globally, if you multiply that across this country, you get an extraordinary kind of sense of how how fast and how mature our sector is becoming, but also how rigorous it has to be. So I've covered some of that stuff uh, in some, uh, moved quite quickly across it. And I was going to finish on a few slides because uh, a few years ago I uh, put a book together about Banksy. And um, fascinating. I was just wondering, I was working on this last night saying, God, all these, all these words, it's a bit dry this, isn't it? A bit, a bit dull. Um, I hope it isn't, hope it isn't, hope it's been interesting. But um, I thought, what would Banksy ever want to do a PhD? Would Banksy ever want to study at HDR level? And, um, and I was thinking, probably not, actually. But uh, all the same, I thought I'd put some pictures in. Because um, in putting together the book on Banksy and asking some questions about um, authority, about um, uh, invisibility, about um, control, it struck a lot of kind of chords with some of my journey doing my PhD. Banksy is very interesting, the world's most... A famous unknown artist, and yet you don't have to go very far, and I know this, go very far to find out who he is, which hospital he was born in, what school he went to, who his mates were, uh, the fact that he played in goal for a team called the Eastern Cowboys. You know, I, I could, I could write, it's all available. Uh, for a price, I can tell you all this. But um, it's all available, and yet the choice of being anon anonymous is his, partly because he says, uh, I'm still wanted by the police, and because that anonymity suits his his approach to his practice, uh, it also fits in with a set of uh, political principles that he still wants to hold. And I say he guardedly because I still wonder whether it's he, she, or they. But let's use he for convenience. Um, and also, it's about a positioning vis-a-vis -vis the art world. So showing in West End in London or showing in posh uh, galleries in New York was all seen as something that Banksy didn't want to be involved in. And I think it was that interest in invisibility and yet authority and autonomy that struck me as being something that we are in attention in our own worlds about how what I've been saying thus far is saying, let's get out there. Let's join in, let's share, let's actually um, make ourselves hyper-evident as both a subject sector, as a subject discipline, as individuals. And I'm fascinated by Banksy and his crew who work in a very different way. Um, and I'm fascinated also by how they choose to kind of articulate their practice, uh, how they 
contextualize their practice through certain use of the written word and through certain use of social media. Um, and also how they use, oh, that shouldn't be there, excuse me, um, how they use all sorts of means to incorporate text and image. And I guess the other one that interests me hugely, and to my great cost, and on another occasion I can bore you to death about my encounters with his IP people, um, namely a Pest Control Office. Pest Control Office are the group that look after his commercial interests. Uh, um, and again, it struck me about something that we're all involved in, in terms of articulating ourselves publicly, uh, hopefully earning some money on the back of it, or at least paying our salary on the back of it, you know, working our salary on the back of it, and how someone like Banksy works in very, very different ways. Banksy is not PhD, he's certainly not in the world of fine art uh, practice, but there's something quite fascinating of the interface between Banksy's activity and the crowds that it attracts, the interest um, that generated in New York during the residency, uh, and the interest that certainly I can generate in, uh, in the press, uh, with the public, and with people who want to know a bit more, and, you know, come the day when they want to know more about HDR or about um, the creative economy or whatever kind of interests me. The last slide is, <clears throat> there's the book, $20 on Amazon. Uh, um, and then the final thing to close on, um, because I've somewhat gone away from the subject of the field, the thorny field of, um, of practice-based research. But about three years ago, I was contacted by the BBC, and they said, um, there's a new Banksy just been found in North London. And I said, so what, you know? Um, and they said, you're a professor. You've written about Banksy. You obviously know uh, whether it's a real one or not. <laughs> really? Uh, okay. And I, I thought for a few seconds, and said, there are three tests, three very simple tests for Banksy. One is, um, if it's a real one, it'll be on his website. That's the basic one. Second one, there's something about the quality of the painting, the quality of the practice that interests me about Banksy. And I've done stencils, and many of you may have worked in stencil, and you can paint very badly in stencil and very ordinarily in stencil. Or you can paint with a certain kind of brushstroke, a certain sort of feathered brushstroke, and you can apply white, as Banksy does, and gives it a kind of a painterliness, which is you know, very different. So I said, that that's the second one, that it's about um, the quality of the practice, the method used during the making. And the third one is about context. And I said, if it, watch, look where it is. Look where it is. Uh, there's a very famous Banksy in Bristol of, um, it's called Well Hung Lover, and he's a naked man hanging outside a window, naked, and from the other side, inside, is the, the, um, the husband, cuckolded husband, looking out the window. And it's very well known. Some of you may remember the image. And it wasn't there for any, any by accident, because on the other side, uh, in the offices, is a, um, a sexual health clinic. And context is all with Banksy. And as John Latham said, context is all in the world of fine art as well. And context is all about what you're doing and what we're involved in. So I said, where is this piece? This is a piece that shows a, a, a child labourer in possibly in the subcontinent in Bangladesh or wherever uh, during a year when the Queen's Jubilee was happening and all sorts of Olympics were happening. So there's a kind of commentary being made there. And it was happening... Um, in a, on a wall, it was painted on a wall next to a supermarket called Poundland, and Poundland had been in the press a, year, a week before for exploiting child labour in India and Bangladesh. So context is all. And those three tests, you can run past it, and, um, and there are other things to say about it. And lo and behold, you get written up straight away. You're on the, pre you're on the, on the money there. Suddenly I was an expert. Suddenly I was insisting. This can, this can happen to any of you. I was an expert and I was insisting. And I, first of all, I'm not an expert and I'm not insisting, but even better, I'm going to stop at this point. I am a highbrow <laughs> specialising in Banksy. I've not been called a highbrow. Thank you very much. <laughs>